Okay. Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is John Cornicello and I've been coming to you twice a week here in Zoom with my conversations with photographers. Uh, today my conversations will be with Rick Salmon. Um, I hope many of you know him. Let's see, I think you have 41 books out now, Rick? Yeah, 41 books. And people say, how do I write so many books? I say, I type fast. <laughs> Very cool. Um, let's see, on Monday of, this of next week, Instead of a guest, I'm going to do a tutorial on soft light and diffusion. I call diffusion confusion. Um, and then if you go to cornicello.com slash photo dash QA, you can see the schedule of other events coming up. But today we want to talk with Rick here. Uh, it's going to be a conversation that we can all be part of. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. But I want to start with um, asking about your new book. You say there's no pictures in it. Well, actually, my last two books <clears throat> have uh, no pictures. One is called uh, Phototherapy, uh, 35,000 words, uh, no pictures. And the current one is called uh, Photo Quest, 55,000 words and no pictures. And, you know, and, you know, the reason I did this, I don't want people to be distracted by my pictures. You know, colors and subjects like I'm looking at a lion here, a beautiful shot of a lion there. I'm looking at the pictures of Cuba there. I wanted to write a book that had that really help people think about their own pictures, not my pictures. And actually out of my uh, 41 books, phototherapy is my most popular photography book. People find that they, especially in these times, that they really need some phototherapy and looking at themselves and not, not how to take a picture. This is really more about why we take pictures and that we're looking inside ourselves. And, you know, Ansel Adams said of, Photograph is uh, often looked at, but not look in, looked into. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get people to look into their pictures to see, you know, every little detail in that picture that makes that picture uh, very interesting or not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have some interesting chapters in there, um, like chapter seven about music. Many of us play music. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about the other people in the room now. How many of you also play music on the side? Nobody? Oh, oh. Yeah. Drums. Steve, what do you play? Steve, what do you play? He's muted. Oh, he's waiting. Hit the space bar. Yeah. There we go. I'm a guitar player. Okay. I, I've played I've played guitar poorly for fifty five years. <laughs> ah. Well, uh that's you know, I I have a friend, Alinda Marshall, who teaches a meditation. I said, I'm too hyper to meditate. She says, well, Rick, when you're playing guitar, you're meditating, right? Because you're, you're focused on it. When you're cutting the lawn, which I, and I just finished cutting the lawn, which I love, that's like meditating. So what photography does, uh, I think we can, you know, express ourselves. We could focus on it. Uh, we could feel good about ourselves. Um, we can share stuff. I think there's no, nothing out there as powerful uh, as photography when it comes to sharing. Oh, Dick is outside now. Yeah. Gerardo, what do you play? I play uh, drums and percussions. Nice. Ah, so you like Santana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to. And when there's nothing around, I use the table. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, you know, yeah. speaking of Santana, <clears throat> I watched his master class. I think some people might be interested in this. He has an hour and a half. Does everyone know about the master classes here? Yeah, I've heard They're of them. online. You know, Martin Scorsese has one, Santana has one, Jane Goodall has one, or Andy Leibovitz has one. Anyway, for an hour and a half, Santana has this class. Maybe it's longer. And he never talks about technique. He never says what key he's playing in. He's never talking about uh, the patterns he's playing, the chords, all this. All he's talking about is the feeling. And what he says is when he's playing guitar, that if you want to be good at guitar, you have to make love to the guitar and you have to feel, feel the music like that. And this is why he's such a great guitar player because he's thinking way beyond, you know, like uh, relating to photography, you know, the aperture, right? The, the exposure triangle, either the aperture, the shutter speed, the ISO and all that other stuff. So he's really thinking, he's a very spiritual person and this is what makes him I think a great guitar player and really different. So we, we just can't, once we get, you know, we live in a generation of pixel peoples, right? <laughs> we zoom in 400% to make sure we have no noise in our pictures or, or whatever in Photoshop or Lightroom. So my philosophy is really want to think about what a picture, what a picture says. Getting back to Santana, 
in my second, in the latest book, Photo Quest, I have a chapter in there on superpowers. And while I'm talking, maybe you guys here in the room could think about your superpower. <laughs> and what I did in this chapter is I asked some of my photographer friends what their superpower is, that what makes them a great photographer without mentioning photography or Photoshop or Lightroom. So getting back to Santana, his superpower isn't that he could play fast, right? Or that he can, or Led Zeppelin, you know, Jimmy Page, that he could play fast or write great music, right? They have other superpowers that let them do this, like maybe concentration, maybe wanting to express yourself. Uh, so Santana, I think superpower is, you know, he's a very spiritual person. And that really comes through in his music. So I asked all these photographers what their superpowers are. And I start off this chapter by saying, well, let me ask you guys here. Who do you think is, are you all unmuted? Who do you think the number one superhero is? Or one of the number one superheroes? Superman. Uh, okay, Superman. That Most people would say Steven Superman. Who do you think another superhero is that comes to mind? Batman. Batman. Okay. Well, guess what? Superman has superpowers. Batman doesn't have any superpowers. Mm -hmm. Batman has to use his brain and his courage. He has no superpowers. He's just a regular person. So this is what we, we, what we want to think about. What is our superpower? So I asked all these photographers, and one photographer said, uh, my friend Alex Morley, he said, well, I'm a perfectionist, to so beyond the point of that it has to be perfect. So this is why... When he's take, he's not going to take a picture unless he knows it's going to be perfect or if he could make it perfect in the digital darkroom. Uh, another photographer, uh, Ron uh, Clifford, said his superpower is that he's an, he made up this word inspiriologist where he inspires people. And I think my, one of my so-called superpowers might be is I don't want to miss anything in life, which is why I have 41 books and 18 Kelby one classes and love to cut the lawn and go on two walks a day and play guitar back there. I don't want to miss anything in life. And so if, and you guys probably can't answer this like right away, but next time you're out on a walk or lying down or relaxing or whatever, if you think about what your superpower is that makes you good at what you're doing, and this actually came up uh, with a conversation I was having with my son. Uh, uh, he, he, uh, he told me about these superpowers. I said, Mark, you know, people who are good at, so at one thing are usually good at, at a lot of things. And people who aren't good at one, <laughs> one thing are probably not good at a lot of things. But it's this superpower that makes us good. Like, you know, there's so many photographers uh, that play music, right, and do other things. So I would like all of you to just think about and drop me a note or next time you're with John, tell him, what do you think your superpower is that, you know, makes you a good photographer? I think it's a very interesting question. And my guess is that no, not too many people here have thought about this. Correct? Yep. Going back to Santana, again, you were at Woodstock, the original Woodstock. I was at with the original Greg Woodstock. Greg Raleigh and Michael Shreve in the band. In 1969, and I actually had a Volkswagen bus like this, and we drove up there, and from what I can remember. <laughs> Very neat. So, yeah, we talked about music. Um, what about some of your salmonisms? Well, my salmonisms, uh, Dick knows. He's been on a lot of the workshops, uh, a lot of the, come to a lot of the uh, seminars. What my salmonisms are, they're not like original sayings. They're not like my original quotes. Like, but they're quick, uh, quick, you know, phrases that drive home a point. Like when it comes to photography, like dead center is deadly, right? That's one of my salmonisms. You want to place the subject off center because if the subject's off center, then what happens is the person looking at the picture, your eye goes around uh, the frame to see what else is in the frame. So dead center is deadly. Uh, uh, you can sleep when you're dead. Right. <laughs> this goes back to me. <laughs> Steve likes that. But this is true. You know, I go out on, on, a, on, a, on a trip or something and, you know, we get up before, uh, before the sun comes up. And we go to sleep after the sun goes down. We process. We do this. So, you know, you can, you can definitely uh, sleep when you're dead if you don't want to uh, miss anything. Uh, another one, backlight, shoot tight. If the subject is backlit, you want to shoot tight so the subject's not uh, uh, too dark. 
Uh, another one name of the game is to fill the frame. When I took this picture of the Wonder Bar behind me, you could in Casper, Wyoming, you could see that every inch of the frame is filled with something. Uh, another one is exposed for the highlights. In other words, if I were taking a picture here, I would expose for the microphone here so you could see the little grooves here uh, so they're not uh, washed out. And I do that by always, always having my histogram set up on the back of my camera or in the view, my mirrorless camera, which I'm using the, I actually like to ask people what mirrorless cameras they're using. I'm using the uh, EOS R. Uh, I am too. Yeah, I, I'm loving it. Yep. So I have the uh, highlight alert set and the histogram set. How many guys uh, are mirrorless here? Yeah, ESR also. Oh, yeah. I'm mirrorless, I shoot in Sony. Say what? I shoot a Sony, I'm mirrorless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for me, I am always, always on a tripod and the mirrorless is almost like working with my four by five now because I can leave, have the, the screen on the back. I don't have to put my eye up to the viewfinder. People, yeah. are, my subjects can hear me talking to them. Well, you know, I, I switched to mirrorless. People think, oh, you switched for the size and the weight. I switched for the, uh, um, the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. yeah, that you could see your white balance in there, your exposure compensation, that you could, uh, you know, uh, see a histogram, that you could see your level, that you could see everything in there. This is why I switched. And I'd say 10 years ago, if uh, John had me on his show, he said, what do you think about mirrorless? I would say, you know, I'm never going to switch. The viewfinder is just terrible. It's just terrible. Now today, I mean, you guys know, right, how good they are. Yeah. Jim's smiling. I think he agrees, right? <laughs> I haven't switched yet, but it's, it's in the cards. <laughs> well, I'll yeah, tell it's, you, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I took the R to uh, Antarctica twice. Yeah. If you go uh, on my website, in my galleries there, uh, I think it's ESR, the bottom of the world, or something about edge of the earth. Uh, anyway, people say, oh, you're going to Antarctica, you know, where, you know, you're not going to be able to uh, you know, buy another camera. I had two cameras. But if something goes wrong, you're going to Antarctica with the, with the camera with one card slot? Well, my whole life, I never screwed up. A, a, and a card never screwed up on me. So I am loving the, I'm loving the art. I'm loving the resolution. I'm loving the focus. And uh, it's, yeah. it's the future for sure. In the Salmonisms there, you mentioned traveled. You're someone who travels quite a bit. How has this whole COVID thing been affecting you? Well, I've worked home for, uh, at home for uh, 35 years. So, and my wife uh, is over in the house right now. So our life here hasn't changed really at all. We still have breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. What has um, changed is I've become a fairly good bird photographer. I, I wish I had the picture on this monitor, but I set up, at, this is to talk about therapy. I bought all these bird feeders and I don't want a picture of a bird on a bird feeder, right? I want a picture so it looks like it's in the wild. So I have all these branches like taped and intertwined with the bird feeders. And I have them set up. And this, is anyone else doing that here? Photographing birds in their backyard? Yeah, oh, Steve. Yeah, I've been doing it. Oh. Pardon? Go ahead again. Oh, yeah. No, I have. So I have all these branches there and I have them set up. So in the morning, I shoot from one side in the afternoon, I shoot from the other side. So I only have a small window because there's a lot of trees around here. But it is so rewarding. Uh, it's it, if, if you're going to try this, I would I would almost guarantee you that you're going to get the least percent, the highest <laughs> percentage of failures because the, these birds move fast. You go to like Alaska, the bald eagles aren't moving as fast. Even though they could fly up to 90 miles an hour, you know, they're far away. So it appears as they're not moving as fast, but these birds go like this. So it's so rewarding, so satisfying. So if you yeah. want to do this, I would suggest uh, setting up, uh, watching the light, set them up at eye level. Uh, that's another salmonism, see eye to eye and shoot eye to eye. Because when you do that, the person looking at the photograph, uh, it relates more to the subject. Uh, so watch the light, watch the background. Different seeds attract different birds. Uh, always keep the seed, uh, uh, feeders full. Let me tell you, actually, I'm working on a, on a big bird project that you'll hear about in a little while. Uh, and I'm working so hard on it. it uh, you can, I think you can see the smile on my face. I am loving, I am loving, and I'm learning a lot about the birds. So it's very therapeutic. Yeah, yes, I was talking to Steven yesterday and he was you were mentioning moose. Yeah, so 
Moose, I, I mean, I, one of the reasons I did my class on Kelby One is because you, Rick, have all these wonderful things out on Safari, uh, and Moose has the beginning wildlife class, but his beginning wildlife, he has his 600 millimeters sitting next to his desk with a sliding glass door that opens up onto yeah. a tree where he's trimmed the branches <laughs> and put a feeder, so that's really the only... That's not beginning wildlife. So I did my zootography class mainly because somewhere in between shooting backyard birds and going on safari, you need to practice looking at lions before you go out and shoot them in the wild. You need to look at giraffes and see how they move and what their tongue does and all that kind of stuff. Um, but now, I, yeah, I'm just shooting stuff in the backyard. We put up a hummingbird feeder. We have a, uh, a woodpecker that likes a telephone pole not too far away, but I've got a brand new 120 to 300 uh, F28 that Nikon just put out, and I bought it to shoot through fencing at a zoo, and the zoos are closed. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. I know. Yeah, where the Bronx Zoo here is closed, they're, they're the virus. But you brought up something to, uh, about a minute ago. You said you have, to, you have to learn about the behavior. And this is key in all wildlife, right, Stephen? You know, this is key. So I'm watching the birds and I'm seeing, uh, and this, this is, might sound funny, but it's true. Before most birds take off, they take a poop so they're lighter. Yes. So if you watch, especially bald eagles, if you watch take a poop, you can get ready and you could actually start shooting before they take off so you could get the, uh, get the bird in flight. But I'm watching these birds. I'm studying the behavior. I'm seeing what time they come. Uh, we have Canada geese on our pond. Every morning, it's like Bosque del Apache, you know. Bosque del Apache, the birds take off at yep. around 7, the blast off. Around 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I was shooting there this morning uh, at ISO 10,000 because it's in the deep shade. But, you know, my, another salmonism. <laughs> my father said, uh, when I asked him about the noise, he said, if a picture's so boring that you notice the noise, it's a boring picture. So <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true. So this picture has some noise in it, but I got a picture of these geese, like taking off with the, you know, the little like ripples behind them, like going. So it's, and I made it into a painting. So it looks, uh, it looks pretty cool using Topaz uh, impression. Anyone here use Topaz impression? I've been no? playing with their masking software. I, I have one of their programs. I just haven't had time to really get into it. Topaz impression. If you haven't tried it, there's a free, uh, free download. Uh, you could take a picture and turn it into like a, like what Monet would do mm -hmm. or what Rembrandt would do or what Van Gogh would do. And there's watercolors in there. And let me tell you, this is amazing. It's called Topaz Impression by Topaz Labs. And uh, uh, let me think if I, oh, actually I have, a, I have one here. I just can't share a regular picture, John, if I share a screen, uh, unless I make it full, let me see. So I have a lot of you stuff can share online. a particular application. So let me turn on share. Yeah, not an code. application. So hold on. Because actually some people were writing things down. So wait, new folder. Oh, no, no, no that's not what I want to do. I want to do this. Do you guys have any questions while I'm doing this? Let me put this picture in here. Where'd it go? Just hold on. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you. This picture was taken at a... Uh, Ralph Lauren's ranch uh, when I was visiting him in the Telluride, Colorado. No, <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. But uh, uh, I did want to see everyone. But anyway, Topaz Impression is amazing. It, it, it turned this uh, very nice scene into, I think, like a work of art. It's beautiful. So Topaz Impression is really, really cool. So does anyone have any questions? I'm here. But I can't see anybody. <laughs> yeah, this is Stephen. I, I do have a question. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Lindsay Adler. Um, how has training changed your photography or your life? I mean, you're a photographer and you're a darn good one. But, but Thank you. How, how, is, how is training and, in your case, writing books really changed things for you? Well, this is an excellent question. Uh, there's an old expression that says that if you want to become an expert on something, write a book about it. 
right? So it sounds funny, but it's true. Like if you're going to put something in print, you better be darn sure that you're going to, that you're right. And if you're going to do a Kelby one class, you better be darn sure you're right. So I, I've been, uh, I think it's been 12 years since my first uh, Kelby one class. I went down there, I did five classes in, uh, in a week, one, a, one a day. And um, the books don't take that long actually to write because I have a formula. But uh, I've been teaching for, and I used to teach actually, I went to Berkeley College of Music. So I, I, and when I uh, got out of there, I was teaching guitar and piano. So I think I've always been a teacher and that might be like uh, another uh, skill or if you want to call it like a superpower. There are people who just love teaching and I, I love teaching another salmonism again it's not my saying but i've adopted it because i use it so much and the saying is uh, we are a part of everyone we meet meaning and this is how we develop our personalities by the time we're seven by the way uh, that we see mostly by the time we're seven we see what we like in other people and we we draw that into ourselves and what we don't like we don't draw into ourselves so that that um that expression we are a part of everyone we meet i think is just so so true and as a teacher you think about okay i, I might tell someone a salmonism like i haven't seen john in years do you remember you remember some of these tips though so teachers become part of other people and i think that's very very cool true yeah, so let's see. Um, again, you're you're not traveling though now. How is that? Do you when do you see travel happening again, or how do you feel about? Well, I canceled just about all my workshops for uh, this year because who knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, especially, there could be like a second wave, right? We don't know. Right. So I just put twenty. Uh, I just put twenty uh, twenty on hold, mm -hmm. and. You know, and I and I'm fine with that. I'm happy uh, photographing the birds, uh, and uh, cutting the lawn and stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I I don't have to depend like uh, some you know, my younger photographer friends, you know, who were doing like you know, twelve workshops a year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, on that note, for for anyone who wants to make this a career, what I say is uh, when you're looking at <clears throat> this it's really a business and i say look at it like your finances with your finances you have to diversify this is the key you don't want to have all your stock in all your you know you just don't you just don't want to have just one stock right you want to diversify you want to have bonds and stocks and all these other things so i think in your photography you want to diversify too so you know i have the books i have uh, I have books, I have ebooks, I have the classes, I, I do some other things. So I think the, uh, diversifying is really important because, you, you know, in other words, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. Right. Well, I think you used to talk about you're specialized and not specializing. Well, that, that's another one. <laughs> well, that, that, that comes to my photography. Like, but, you know, uh, as Steve was saying, if you learn how to photograph a lion, right? And you're looking at the eyes, and he has that great picture behind him, or had it behind him. I can't stand him anymore. Jaguar. Uh, of uh, pardon? He has a jaguar behind him right now. Now he has a jaguar. Okay, so he's uh, looking he's at changed the, from the lion. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he's he's looking. Okay, he's looking at the uh, at the jag jaguar. So he's looking at you know. If I were to critique this picture, you know, very nice, even light on the animal's face, great eye contact, the face is looking right at it. Like I said before, it's off center. It's more of an environmental uh, picture. So if you're good at Jaguar photography, you're probably good at people photography. So what you learn in one area, you can apply to another area. Uh, if you're good at landscape photography, if you're used to seeing the light and the shadows and shooting in, layers, in other words, uh, something in the foreground, something in the midground, something in the background, you're probably good at street photography. So this is what I think is so cool about uh, being a photographer that what you learn in one area, uh, you can apply to another area. So I'm getting in the chat, Rick, is there any place in the world that you'd like to travel that you haven't visited yet? I think uh, Greenland. Um, that's the uh, I, I've been to a lot of places. Actually, my wife and I have been to about 100 different countries. And uh, Greenland's, I, 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 I just love the ice. 
I love ice. I love blue ice. And in Greenland, they have plenty of that. And people think, uh, a lot of people go to Antarctica for the wildlife. Well, I like the wildlife there. But if I had a choice between shooting the wildlife or the, uh, uh, the, the ice, it would be the ice. Because you have these magical sculptures that are ever-changing. They're just fantastic. What other experiences are, are you looking forward to? What other experiences? Well, I'm playing a bass guitar every day. So I'm looking forward to getting better at bass. And actually, I was practicing so hard because I wanted to be in a band. <laughs> uh, but now you can't really do that, which is kind of sad. But I'm still playing every day. Um, as far as photography goes, uh, again, I, I've, been, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, another, what I'm really enjoying is playing in Photoshop and Lightroom. I never get tired of that. Uh, there's always something new. You know, Ansel Adams said a picture's never really done. So I encourage people to go back and look at some of their pictures and say, okay, what would it look like as a black and white? What would it look like, you know, if I increased the contrast? What would it happen if I put a little vignette on it? What would happen if I, you know, uh, did whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, look for several pictures within the picture, like this scene behind me, right? There's probably 11 different pictures that you could uh, find in there. So I do that. I think that's very therapeutic. I just heard of an application like Zoom today called Jam Kazam. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's I have heard. It's supposed and to have very little latency, if any, that you can actually play with people around in different places. Yes, that's what I want to, I want to try. We should try that. John's a musician. When I did the creative live show, we, uh, we had some fun. You came in playing a little melodica. Wasn't yeah, it? melodica, right. <laughs> you were playing the melodica. See, I remember. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a friend, Paul Kobler. And uh, he wants to do that too. So um, I was watching, do you guys know Playing for Change, that group? No, I don't if, think so. If you want to see uh, some great musicians, they're called Playing for Change. Um, and they do Stand By Me and they've done it all around the world. Anyway, they use that. The, the, one that, the first one that I saw was there was a guy playing in like uh, in New York City, a guy playing in California, a guy playing in France, a guy playing in, uh, in Africa. It was it was really cool. Playing for change. So you still can't see the rest of us, huh? I just pulled out my keyboard. I have a, a keyboard drawer under my desk drawer. No, I can't. And I've got two. I don't know why. I can see me. I can only see me. And uh, I clicked did you on spotlight Zoom. your own video. I'm not sure. What? Maybe you spotlighted your own video. Well, I don't know how to uh, window. Close Up at the very top of the screen where it says it's recording, has the time to say speaker view or... See, I don't see that anymore. You don't see any of that board, Ben? Oh, no, I don't see uh, anything. Nope. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I was trying get to... Out of, get out of full screen, maybe? No, I'm, I'm not in full screen. Oh, there we go. Now I can see everybody again. Okay, so oh, now I can have a closer look at that Jaguar picture. That is nice. So yeah, so I I built this keyboard in the, under here. Cool. So I can pop that out I once in a while and play. That something. picture made it into the uh, the July 2019 uh, AZA calendar, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Really? Yeah. That's it's the second time I've been in. I got in with the uh, lion triplets a couple of years before. It's tough because it's only open to zoo employees and volunteers. So there's yeah. thousands and thousands of people taking pictures at zoos. <laughs> that one made it in. So what, what type of photography do you guys like? I'm going to start with uh, Melissa. What do you do? Um, I do senior portraits, but I do have a question. I was sure. supposed to go to Alaska on a cruise in July and that just got canceled yesterday. What should I do to prepare next year? We're going to go. And I of course want to get the wildlife. What should I do to prepare for that? I have a year now to prepare. Are you going to be on a, uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry the trip was canceled. Are you going to be yeah. on a big ship or a small ship? Um, a medium sized, I suppose it's not huge, but it's not one of the smaller ones. So you're going to be able to go around in Zodiacs and photograph like the bears and the eagles. Well, I, I had a couple of excursions booked and one was a whale watching excursion. Yeah. I just never been anywhere like that. And I really was excited about taking photos. But now that you were talking about studying animals, I better be prepared. Yeah. Well, uh, can you go without doing what I did screwing up zoom? Can you go on my website? 
Yes. Go on my website, and if you click on, uh, let me know when you're there. And if you guys, you guys maybe want to do this because th it'd be easier if I. Uh... Okay. Where am I looking? Okay. Go in the galleries on the left. Okay. And when that, uh, oh, I guess because Zoom's running, it's. Uh, it's not happening. Go scroll oh, down to adventure. go, go yeah. down to Alaska Adventure. Yeah, I would kill to be able to do that. So okay. Oh, so so you're there, right? I am. Yes. Okay. So those bald eagle shots. Uh, what time of year are you going? July next July. Okay, the bald eagles will be gone. Uh, they will. Yeah, they'll be. Well, you might see a few. Well, what's we the go, time? Because we, go, we can. Well, we go now. in. Yeah, we go in April. Okay. During the herring spawning season, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So you're looking at those shots. To tell you the truth, it's not that hard to get those shots. Okay. I mean, some of them were taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens because there's so much herring. So I, I would research, um, you know, the wildlife. What wildlife is going to be there? If you're going to be in a zodiac doing a uh, a whale watch, right? Yeah. You want to cover your camera. Right with the plastic bag, you don't have to buy a fancy. Uh, you don't have to buy a fancy uh, camera cover, uh, but make sure that you shoot wide because you're going to be the boat's going to be going in like this. And if you shoot tight to get a really uh, tight shot of the whale, and if it's lopsided, you might crop it and crop off the tail right. or the head or, or whatever. So I'd shoot wide, have a plastic bag, and I always have one of these uh, microfiber cloths with me. Mm -hmm. so make sure that you're constantly cleaning your lens because you're going to have a lot of salt spray around there. Oh, there Stephen has a bald eagle uh, <laughs> look, <laughs> looking. Uh, so the, and Melissa, what I, lenses let's say Stephen, yeah, I would say if you're in the Zodiac uh, uh, or a little boat, a, a 24 to 105, you know, would be fine. All right. Um, and uh, I would say make sure you're shooting at a fast enough shutter speed. Make sure you shoot at a fast enough shutter speed so you don't get blur. So maybe a two fiftieth of a second, even though the whale's you know going slow, the boat's going to be moving. And first thing I do is, if you're going in a small boat, I'd say to the other people, "Can you just move slowly and gently?" Yeah. Because <laughs> you don't want them to move the boat. Uh, but Stephen might have some uh, tips too. Okay. For photos, Melissa, which long longest lens you had taking? Well, I, I'm going to borrow. I just switched to Sony last year, so the mm -hmm. longest one I have is the 70 to 200. But I have a friend who has, I don't know Sony lenses that well yet. It's up to 600, I think. It's okay. it's a range. Well, yeah, so. let me tell you, I've been on so many workshops and so many trips. I was in on this in Antarctica in January. There were so many people there with new cameras who had never used them. They bought it for the trip of a lifetime. And they didn't know, even people, someone bought an iPad. And just to pretend this, this is like uh, my iPhone is an iPad. They bought an iPad and they bought a case for it. And the case was like covering half, half the camera and all their pictures were coming out and they didn't know. So. Test, 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 right, Stephen? Absolutely. And, and one of the things I, I teach in, in my class, not to hype that, is that before you go out with, on a safari or you go out to Alaska, go somewhere where you can practice shooting animals. Where, where do you live, Melissa? Michigan. Okay. So you, you've got lakes. I mean, you've got shorebirds. You've got all kinds of really cool stuff to yep. practice on when it's cold, when it's hot. I mean, you've got a hot summer coming up. You've got a, a very cold winter coming up. Um, practice, 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 so that you can change the settings on your camera without looking, okay? You wanna be able to, to, to make those changes. You want to, if, if your camera has um, the settings where you can flip from, you know, like a Nikon, a C1 to C2, so different, memory settings, yeah, I have you want to ha have your stuff to where it's uh, really, really fast. Um, and then you want to also have it to where you have a great depth of, of field or this and that. You want to have as many different possibilities all set up and practice switching back and forth so that you don't have to take your eye off. Oh, speaking of taking your eye off, learn to shoot with both eyes open. 
<laughs> because <laughs> I mean, I have a nasty habit of closing one eye and then I miss what's outside right. my frame because <laughs> I shoot really long lenses. But if I'm shooting, you know, at 500 millimeters and I'm concentrating on this, I don't see the other bear approaching. You got to you got to keep both eyes open. So it's a matter of practice, practice, practice. Make sure you're familiar with your camera. Make sure you're familiar with what birds do. The, he gave like one of the best tips ever. Birds poop before they take off. Okay. Now, I mean, that you'd be surprised how much that helps because when you're, you know, shooting a number of frames per second, you can do that just as they poop. As soon as they're done, start shooting. It's just a matter of practice, practice. And don't wait till you get to Alaska to start shooting birds. Right. Well, yeah. And I'll just add to just knowing your camera. <clears throat> There's an, one of, another salmonism is uh, one out of focus picture is a mistake. 20 out of focus pictures is a style. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the thing is, you don't really want to get a lot of out of focus pictures. And with the whales moving, I mean, it's easy to make mistakes. You know, people, just because you have an autofocus camera, it doesn't mean that the camera knows where to focus. So I'm looking at Steven there, right? And uh, is that a composite? The eagle, in the, or is it really against the grass? It, that, no, that's against the glass. Uh, okay. Against the grass, yeah. So the eagle's against the grass. So if Steven just had, you know, like the center point for, uh, set, like I always have, it was just moved up a little, the grass would, would have been out of fo uh, in focus and the eagle would have been out of focus. Uh, and also there are cameras that, you know, track the subject. So you want to practice all these practice with all these different autofocus settings to see which one is right. Because I cannot tell you when I do these, uh, when I do my workshops, how many, how many people, their pictures are just a little out of focus, right? And if it's a little out of focus, you really can't, can't fix it. So there's some comments coming in. Gerardo is saying he wants to put into practice your salmonism about noise. He's beginning to be a noise hater, so we'll practice on getting amazing photos where noise, if any, doesn't affect the image. Well, yeah. uh, on that note, there are photographers. Uh, you could do a search after this. Uh, Robert Farber, David mm -hmm. Hamilton, they, they built their reputation on grainy pictures. Yeah, right? in the 60s. In the 60s, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I wouldn't like my, my father's thing about if the picture's so boring, you notice the noise in Photoshop and then the other, other programs, you could add noise. <laughs> and by it, you know, it, and if you think noise is bad, think of a George Surratt's uh, painting, uh, Sunday in the Park with George. This is pointillism, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's a million point, points in there. Um, but, you know, I was photographing again on my pond this morning at uh, ISR 10,000. And I had to turn the picture into a painting because it was, you know, the darker it is, the more underexposed, more dark areas uh, there are in the scene, the more the noise is going to show up. If you shoot at ISO 10,000 at the beach on a sunny day or, uh, or, or, uh, or in a when it's snowy on a sunny day, the noise is still there, but you're not going to notice it. So you notice noise in dark areas and out of focus areas. So anyway, <clears throat> I rather have a picture with noise in it than a, a no picture. blurry shot. So, I, but on that note, I'm going to ask Stephen because uh, uh, we were talking back and forth here. Uh, after I say what I'm going to say, I never shoot on auto ISO because I always want to know what auto. I, I want to always shoot at the lowest possible ISO to get the shot I want. This morning, the lowest possible ISO was ISO 10,000 to get a handheld shot at a thousandth of a second when the birds are taking off. But most bird photographers I know do like to use auto ISO. So Stephen, I want to ask John too. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> I, I only just started. I, I was always, I was taught manual, 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 control everything. And I'm a control freak. So what I found was that I was missing a lot of shots as animals went in and out of shade. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't adjust fast enough. I mean, I, and I know where the dial is. I just couldn't, couldn't. So I tried auto ISO and I realized that I was, I was constantly setting the shutter speed. I was absolutely always setting the aperture. And the only thing I ever seemed to change was the ISO. So I 
went to auto, not always, certainly not in the studio and, and not when I'm shooting, you know, all sun or all shade, but yeah. Every and you can and limit then, the range of auto ISO too. Yeah. You, you can yeah. limit it. Yeah. The only time Which I you have to remember Cuba. though, you have to remember when you're looking at the back of your camera, you don't see a lot of noise. You have to pay attention to what you've really done. Because I came home one day after shooting and realized that all my pictures were very noisy. And, and I could have, I could have changed the shutter speed, but didn't, and I wish I had. Well, I, I, on the advice of a friend, and listen to him, I said, recently, I said, okay, I'm gonna try it. And I blew a shot, I blew a shot because the ISO was just not right. Yeah. So Daniel's saying that he does a bit of fashion, beauty, sports, wildlife, birds, and product. Gerardo would like to get into product photography. And George does contemplative photography and is a huge meditator. Uh, he's mentioned your book on contemplative photography that helped him explore the genre even oh. deeper than he was before. Oh, thank you, George. We can't see George's picture, but uh, thank you, George. Also said something about ducks is that they will duck their head in the water before flapping their wings. Well, these cat, well, the cat, the cat, Canada geese here, they're like grazers, you know, like you go to Africa, you want to get a great picture of a zebra or a wildebeest, they're grazers or a horse, right? You're driving around the country, they're grazers, they're always have their head down. The reason there's so much Canada geese poop around here is because they always have their, not always, a lot of times they're, they head underwater. But uh, I've been watching the, the bird behavior, but this is, this is the key to understand uh, you know, all, all the different behavior like of uh, lions uh, when you go to Africa and, uh, you know, how often they blink and how often they mate, which is every 20 minutes usually, uh, and it goes on for three days. So knowing, knowing all this stuff is so important. So you have to become like, if you're going to be a wildlife photographer, I think you have to become uh, a naturalist. Hey, okay, I want to comment. Can you guys see Steve's picture there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this, this is a good example, I think, of exposing for the highlights, right? If he didn't expose for the highlights, all the, that, the white area uh, around the face there, if he made a print, it'd be as white as the paper. So this is why I think it's important uh, to, uh, actually, you can see Steve's shirt is a little overexposed or blown out. So, <laughs> uh, but, but that's okay, because we're just, you know, zooming here with, uh, you know. Well, I found out that if you have a white shirt on, if yeah. your camera normally overexposes, yeah. you put a white shirt on, then your computer is more likely to bring it down so your face right. isn't overexposed as much. Right. So what, what I'm saying is that, that, that shot behind you is perfectly exposed because you exposed and the exposure was set for the highlights. So this is really important to do. Yeah, I think there's a difference there from when we switch to digital, people who shot slide film like myself, ectochromes and kodachromes were more easily to move into digital than those who shot negative film. Okay, let me ask the people here. How many people here shot slide film? I know you did, John. Yeah. And, okay, Melissa, never slide. Harada? Slide, yeah, I think so. Well, John and, uh, and uh, Dick, yep. may, 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 oh, okay, and uh, down here, um, I can't see the name. Mark? Someone else. Uh, when we used to shoot slide film, we used the BLH rule. Does anyone here know what the BLH rule is? John? No? The BLH rule is this, that when we shot slide film, we had to bracket like hell. Oh. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, the exposure latitude and the forgiveness of a raw file today is how many stops is it? I don't even know. Mm -hmm. But when you shot slide film, if you were a quarter of a stop off, you didn't have the right exposure. So you had to bracket like hell. When I did underwater photography with slide film and all the underwater photographers who sh shot slide film will tell you the same thing. <clears throat> we got one good shot on a roll of 36. We were lucky. I actually had someone who was able to tape uh, two 36 exposure rolls together, put them in a canister because there's enough room. So I had 72 exposures on a dive. So I could get two good shots. I mean, people, Melissa, you don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> you know, 
that a the the, the dyna every time a new camera comes out the dynamic range increases mm -hmm. every time a new version of photoshop and lightroom comes out uh, does a better job of reducing noise there's tons of plugins that do a great job reducing noise opening up uh, shadows toning down highlights uh, you know it's just it's just amazing John, is that a Santana hat? Because it's Santana wears hats in that shape. No, I, I don't know. I got this on my way back from Cuba in Miami. And oh. did, did Paul join us? Yeah, someone else. Yeah, Paul just joined us. Paul's walking around. Paul and I share, shared a studio. You're on mute, Paul. So before we go, guys, because I got to get going soon, do you guys have any questions? I have uh, one more question, Rick. Yep. I know. When am I going to come to San Miguel de Allende and doing a workshop with you? That, I don't know. <laughs> that's one. And another photo is, another question is, if I'm doing a portrait of a baby or a person, but it, the, head's, the head is slightly tilt, how can I get both eyes in focus? Is that a um, small aperture? Well, it's a small aperture, and I usually focus on the nearest eye. But another tip, when you moved your head, I saw it. If you're photographing at an angle, like if I'm, a, if I'm like a profile, right? Yeah. That, that's, a, that's an okay profile. <laughs> but if I turn my head slowly, there'll be a point where the tip of my nose looks like it's hanging off my cheek. I can't see it. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you don't want to break the cheek line. You don't want to break the cheek line. I'm trying to say it at the same time. So you want to use the cheek as a background for the for the nose. Okay. And this is the same thing, Steve, right? An animal photography, right? Uh, and as far as uh, wildlife photography goes, unless you're going for a silhouette, and Steve's pictures uh, illustrate this uh, very eloquently, uh, the tip is if the eye's not in focus and well lit, you've missed the shot. Right. Okay. So that's why for most bird photographers, most bird photographers love, unless they're going for a silhouette, love to shoot with the sun at their back. So same, same settings or same, same thing for the picture you showed yesterday about the king penguins. You have three penguins at different distance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I was shooting at with a wide angle lens and a small aperture and getting back to the focus. So if you notice this picture of the wonder bar, Everything is in focus from the drinks uh, over here to way back here. So I'm using a wide angle lens, a small aperture, and I, and I focused one third into the scene. So again, if I had just set the focus automatically, it would have focused you know, in the center and the okay. foreground might have been out of focus. Thank so, you, Rick. Oh, sure. So, Your parents would be proud of you. You always say thank you. <laughs> really, people write me emails. Mom. People write me emails. They never say thank you. So, good for you. Always say hello and say goodbye and thank you. That was my rule. Yes, well, that's good. One. Good. Yeah. Well, so, so, listen, guys, yeah. I gotta go. I gotta get get ready for something at two. I wanted to thank John for having me. Melissa, good luck uh, with Alaska. Sorry your trip was postponed. Steve, it was good seeing your uh, pictures behind. Ian, good luck with all your flying around. Uh, good for you. We need uh, more people doing good stuff uh, like you. Mark, uh, I'm finally going to uh, put my 3D glasses back on. <laughs> to look at your thing. Uh, Dick, it was great seeing you. Dwayne Rogers, backlit. Look at Dwayne's nice uh, picture there. Backlit, little hair light, nice catch light in the eyes, nice smile, good looking guy, a nice, nice. black and white. How about x ray glasses. Uh, yeah, Larry was here, and uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, thank you, John, for having me, and oh, thank you, I hope Rick. everyone, and stay safe, everyone. Okay, wear those masks, wash your hands. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. See everyone, remember, Thanks, Rick. Mondays, it. Mondays and Thursdays, I'm on here. So join me again, ten o'clock Pacific and one Eastern, and we'll see you all soon. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.